Are you ready for the word? Yes, sir. We're going to be in Enoch 20. Verse 1, these are the names of the holy angels who watch. Uriel, one of the holy angels who is over the world and over Tartarus. He's mentioned by name at least 16 times in the book of Enoch. Giving instruction to Enoch. Raphael, one of the holy angels, who was over the spirits of men. He's mentioned by name at least 15 times in the book of Enoch. <coughs> Ragiel, one of the holy angels who takes vengeance on the world of the luminaries. I can find where he's mentioned two different places. Michael, one of the holy angels, to wit, he that is set over the best part of mankind and over chaos. He's mentioned 18 times in the book of Enoch, three times in the book of Daniel, once in the book of Jude, and once in the book of Revelation. There's more said about him than any of the rest of them. Saragiel, so one of the holy angels who is set over the spirits, who sin in the spirit. This is the only place I can find him mentioned. Um, I, I'm not familiar with whether he gets mentioned in other um, apocryphal writings or not, but this is the only place I can find him uh, mentioned. Gabriel, one of the holy angels who is over paradise and the serpents and the cherubim. Four times he's mentioned in Enoch, twice in Daniel and twice in the book of Luke. And as I said last week or week before last, I actually think he is the, more familiar, the one we're more familiar with than the rest. And then the last one, Remiel, one of the holy angels whom Yahweh set over those who rise. And again, this is the only place that he is mentioned. So we got this list of holy angels, and it's not just a list of angels Enoch was introduced to, like in, hey Enoch, I'd like for you to meet Remiel. It's far more than that. Enoch was introduced to him because he was seeing everything that Yahweh had assigned them to do. Uh, everything Yahweh had set them over. He witnessed the order and the rank of the heavenly holy angels and the great responsibilities they had, and he relayed that information to us. And what stood out to me in this particular part of our study is how we go to other places and learn more about all of them except for two. Saragiel, who is over the spirits who sin in the, who sin in the spirit. This is the only place in, uh, that he or his responsibility is listed. And Remiel, who is over those who rise. This is the only place that he or his responsibility is listed. I, I like the way it is worded, however, about Remiel. It said, whom Yahweh set over. Yahweh personally set him over those who rise. Yahweh put him there. So it doesn't matter how little else we know about him. We know this very important part. Yahweh set him over those who rise. If there is more important information about him than this, I don't know where it is. If there is a clear, undeniable meaning of his name, I haven't found it. I have found some um, who suggest that his name means Yahweh lifts up, but I haven't been able to confirm uh, that, that information, so I, I wouldn't say it definitively. What I'm trying to say is the length, breadth, depth, and height of all I know about him, the sum total of everything I know about him is what we just read. His name is Remiel, and he's over those who rise. So if you will, rather than talking so much about him, I want to talk about what he's over. Because that's the important part. That's why Yahweh put him there. Because the job that needed to be done was important. Yahweh placed him over those who rise because those who rise are important to Yahweh. <clears throat> that might be a lesson we need to make sure we learn. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter if anybody ever knows our name or knows anything about us. If Yahweh gives us an assignment, whatever that assignment is, that assignment is important. He assigned it to us for two reasons. One, because he trusted us. He trusted Remiel. So he assigns it to us because he trusts us. But number two, more importantly, 
He assigned it to us because it was something important that he needs to have done. Right? Last time in our study of Enoch 20, we talked about Gabriel and we looked in Luke 1 where we see that Yahweh sent him to Nazareth to speak to a young virgin girl named Mary. Let's go back there for just a minute because I think we can tie these two things together here. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And Gabriel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with Yahweh. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yahshua. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the almighty Yahweh shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now think about what just transpired there for a moment. Yahweh sends Gabriel to a very young lady. How young? I don't know, but I would say we wouldn't be wrong in, in estimating in the mid-teens. Okay? No one knew her outside of Nazareth, and yet Yahweh is trusting her with the most important task any living human being has ever been entrusted with. He didn't require that the person be entrusted with this task be well known, have a reputation of, of, of being able to handle great things. I don't know what the criteria is that he used to choose her, but he trusted her with this thing he needed to have done. It wasn't about elevating her and it wasn't about making her well known. It was a task that was important to him. And so he chose her to take care of his son for him. We all have to become less mindful of titles and recognition and more mindful of tasks that Yahweh needs us to do. In 1 Kings chapter 17, you can look there if you want to. I don't know that I'm going to read from there, but the story I'm going to talk about is found there. In 1 Samuel 17, Eliyahu, known today as Elijah, had prophesied to Ahab that it would not rain again until he said so. This created a situation where Yahweh would need somebody to house and feed this prophet for three years. Three years. He first sent the prophet to Kareth, Kareth, to set up camp there, and he sent ravens to provide for the prophet for a period of time to the brook Kareth. And that worked for a while because the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and they brought him bread and flesh in the evening. Isn't that awesome? Yahweh needed somebody to take care of this prophet and he sends ravens to do it. Morning and evening. Where's he getting his water from? From the brook. But what happens in a drought? The brook dries up. <coughs> So when the brook dried up, the word of Yahweh came to the prophet and said, I want you to go to Zarephath. And this is what Yahweh said to him, quote, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain you there. Do you hear what he said? All right. And it says the prophet came to the gates of the city and, and it literally says he saw the woman. So he knew that this was the woman that Yahweh had commanded to sustain him. Yahweh had already told her, nourish and make provision for this prophet. So he said to her, knowing that she's the one, I pray or beseech you that you would bring me something to drink. We're going to get back to Remiel in a moment. This is important. Put yourself in the position of both that prophet and, and that widow. <clears throat> I don't know how many times that you have known, that you've known, that you've known, that you've heard something from Yahweh. 
whether it's an impression, whether it's a word, whether it, it, it's the, the scriptures coming alive, they are alive, they live and the, 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 the word of Yahweh is alive, uh, or, or, or the vision, a dream, whatever. You, I don't know how many times you've had Yahweh tell you something, but if you have, then you probably can identify with him. If you are the widow here, and you heard Yahweh say, I'm sending you a prophet and I want you to sustain him. She had to be thinking one of two things. <coughs> she either had to be thinking, wow, Yahweh must be fixing to bless me because I don't have anything to take care of myself, much less somebody else. There must be some big blessings to be about to come into my life. I can't wait. Where's it going to happen? Or... She had to be thinking, I must have heard him wrong. There's no way that I can do what he told me to do. And every day the prophet didn't show up, I think, was a relief to her and confirmation to her that she had heard wrong. But what if you're the prophet Elijah? You had to be thinking when Yahweh said, I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you. Don't you think you would at least have to think, wow. I'm going to Zarephath and there's a widow woman there and her husband died and he left her in good shape. She's got plenty. She can take care of herself and she can take care of me. Or perhaps he's thinking Yahweh has spoken to her. So as soon as, as, soon as I get to Zarephath, she's going to be there waiting on me looking for me, she'll know me, and she'll come up to me, and she'll say, glad you're here, Yahweh told me to take care of you. Don't you think that's logical? Sure it is. But none of that happened. Instead, when Elijah sees this widow woman, she's out gathering sticks. He knows she's the one, but she hasn't come rushing up and said, hey, Yahweh told me to take care of you. And when he looked at her, she certainly didn't look wealthy. And she didn't even acknowledge him. And so he said to her, I'm paraphrasing, but he said to her, ma'am, would you please bring me something to drink? There's no indication if you read that text that she ever even answered him. She goes to do what he wants her to do, but there's no indication she answered him. Either she's irritated by his request or perhaps she knew who he was and was relieved that water was all he was requesting. Maybe that was going to be all that was required, is give him some, something to drink. And that is sustain him. But as she's walking away, the prophet knows what he has to do. And no doubt it was hard to do it. But he did it anyway. He said, ma'am, also bring me a bit of bread in your hand. Hmm. And that's where this amazing story actually takes off. Because she stops and confronts him and says, Sir, I don't have a cake in the King James. What she said is, I don't have a loaf of bread. You're asking me to bring you a piece of bread. I don't have a loaf of bread to take a piece off of. All I have is a handful of meal in a barrel and a little bit of oil in a saucer. I came out to gather two sticks to go back in to make a fire and to cook that little bit of, of meal and oil, put them together and make a small cake so that me and my son might eat it. And then I guess we're going to die. <coughs> <clears throat> what Elijah did next, I think may have required more obedience and courage from him than any other thing he ever did. He said to that woman, fear not, go do like you just said, but make me a little piece of bread first. Bring that to me, then go back in and make for you and your son. <coughs> wow. But he followed that up with this. He said, thus saith Yahweh, that barrel of meal will not run out and that cruise of oil will not fail until the day that Yahweh sends rain upon the earth. 
You just said that's all that's left. I'm telling you that all that is left is all that we need. It'll last us as long as it needs to last us. So here's the point. Over a three-year span of time, Yahweh used ravens and then a widow woman to sustain his prophet. And this prophet and his, his assignment were important to Yahweh. And that's the reason Yahweh had people assigned to take care of it. So, so here's my question to you. And you're open, some of you, to 1 Kings 17. What's the name of that widow woman? Doesn't say. Because it wasn't about elevating her. It wasn't about giving her a, a great name. Yahweh assigned her that task for many reasons. But among those reasons was he had a task that was important to him. And that was taking care of Elijah. It's going to end up that she's also taken care of. But he assigned her that task because taking care of Elijah was very important to him. Now I said... We don't know her name, but I promise you this, heaven knows. I promise you this, Yahweh knows, right? We all have to become less mindful of titles and recognition and more mindful of tasks that Yahweh may need us to do. Whether that is give a cup of cold water in his name. Whether it's to help sustain somebody. Or something that's advancing the kingdom. Perhaps it is like Mary to raise a child in the nurture and admonition of Yahweh. Perhaps it's to teach. I don't know. But I do know that it always involves more than just being a listener or a student. We can't get so comfortable just being listeners and students that we're never listening to see what Yahweh might assign us to do. No matter how small or how large. There are things that are important to Yahweh and he's far more interested in finding people who will do those things than he is in finding people who are hoping to be used in such a way that they become well known. I'm not going to repeat that. You can go back and put it on replay. But that was very important. When Yahweh chooses us and uses us, it isn't because he's trying to exalt us or make us feel important. It's because the thing he needs done and wants done is important. That's the reason he chooses us. So, let me say it this way, back to Enoch 20. He didn't say to Remiel or any of the other archangels, y'all are important and special to me, so I think I'm going to find something for y'all to do. No. He said, these things are important to me, and I need someone to look after them for me. Therefore, I've called you and equipped you to do this task. To Uriel, he said, the world in Tartarus are important to me. I need you to watch over them. To, to Raphael, he said, the spirits of men are important to me. I need you to watch over them. To uh, Ragiel, he said, the luminaries are important to me. I need you to watch over them. To Michael, he said, my covenant people and chaos are important to me. I need you to watch over them. To Sa Saragiel, he said, spirits and spirits who sin are important to me. I need you to watch over them. He said to Gabriel, paradise and the heavenly host around my throne are important to me. I need you to watch over them. And to Remiel, he said, those who rise are important to me and I'm assigning that task to you. And do you see the difference? Yahweh doesn't find important people and set them over stuff. Yahweh has important stuff to do and he finds people that he can trust to do it. Yes. One more point before we focus on Remiel's assignment. This came up in my spirit as I was contemplating these things. You know, I, I got to thinking about all the prophets that Yahweh chose. And he chose none of them because of their education. He chose none of them because of their social standing. He chose them because he knew they'd be willing to do what he asked them to do. And every one of them suffered greatly. They were mocked, they were scorned, they were beaten, they were killed. They weren't chosen to make them popular because it, that's not what happened. They were hated. They were despised. But know this, Yahweh didn't allow them to go through all of that hatred and rejection because he didn't care about them. <coughs> 
He called them and sent them knowing the things they were going to face, but he sent them anyway. And here's why he sent them anyway. He sent them anyway because of how important his covenant people are to him. Knowing what many of them would do to the prophets, he sent the prophets anyway because the prophets would turn some. That was important to him. So if Yahweh tells us to do something, it isn't because he thinks we're all that. He tells us because he sees in us a willingness and he tells us to do it because whatever it is he's told us to do, even if it's just give a cup of cold water, Whatever he is telling us to do, it's important to him or he wouldn't be telling us to do it. Enoch chapter 20 says, Remiel, a mighty, powerful creature of Yahweh, was put over those who rise. So those who rise then are important to him. So that's the point we've been moving toward. Let's talk about rising. It's important to Yahweh. It should be important to, to us. I can say this with the same conviction that the Apostle Paul said it with. <clears throat> if there is no resurrection, we are of all men most miserable. What we're doing is just subjecting ourselves to unnecessary misery if there is no resurrection. So let's go look at the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to read a lot. We're going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that the Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried... And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So any talk of a resurrection of the dead has to start there. Had Yeshua not been raised, nobody would ever be raised. So it has to start there. Verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, or Peter, then of the, tw then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. So Paul saw him also. Saw him briefly, but he saw him. Verse 12. Now, if the Messiah be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is the Messiah not risen. And if the Messiah is not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. Notice how Paul was not going to allow the people of Corinth to pick and choose what they want to believe. I believe that Yeshua rose from the dead, but I don't believe that we rise from the dead. Paul said, no, 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 no. You don't get to pick and choose what you're going to believe. He said to them, if you don't believe we all are going to be resurrected, then you don't believe the Messiah was. And if you don't believe he was, then you're not forgiven of your sins and you have no salvation. Your faith is emptiness. Whereas, he said, if you believe that he was resurrection, then you believe that your sins are forgiven. That, that is, if, if you believe he died for you and that, that you should live for him. And he said, and if you believe that he was resurrection, resurrected, then you believe that the one who raised him will also raise us. They go together. I believe he was resurrected and I believe that the one who resurrected him is also going to resur resurrect us. Verse 15. Yes, and we're found fault witnesses of Elohim, because we have testified of Elohim that he raised up the Messiah, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. See what he's doing there? You say you don't believe in a resurrection, then, then you're calling us liars when we say Yeshua was raised from the dead. If Yeshua was not resurrected, every apostle is a false witness. Because every apostle says they saw him after he was resurrected. 
To say you do not believe in a resurrection of the dead is a serious thing, in other words. Verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not the Messiah raised. And if the Messiah be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in the Messiah are perish. And here's that verse we quoted a while ago. If in this life only we have hope in the Messiah, we are of all men most miserable. There were some people who were teaching and some people who were believing that you should believe in Yeshua as the Messiah just so you could have your best life now. And Peter said, if that's all we got, we're miserable. In other words, Peter's, or Paul's saying, these folks are putting no emphasis on eternity at all. And that's what it's all about. This life is but a vapor. It'll be over quick. We've got to focus on eternity. Verse 20. But now is the Messiah risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in the Messiah shall all be made alive. And every man in his own order, the Messiah, the first fruits, afterward, they that are the Messiahs at his coming. All right, we've got a lot more to read, but I want to focus on verse 23 for a second. We want to make sure we read that part again and that we listen to what it said. Yeshua was the first to be resurrected. Contrary to what Carmen said in his song about Lazarus up there in heaven talking to Abraham and everything. He wasn't. Okay. Yeshua was the first. After him, all that are his will be resurrected. When? Read it carefully. When will all that are his be resurrected? When? At his coming. At his coming. I know what people say. Yeah, that's their bodies that get resurrected, but they've already been resurrected. Now, let me tell you something. <clears throat> Grandma and Grandpa are not running around up in a place called heaven without a body. Yes, that's right. That's yep. right. So, let's figure out where the rest of Grandma and Grandpa are. That is, if their body is in the grave, where is the part of them that made them the them that they were? Their soul or their spirit? The closest place to look, there's a lot of places we could look, but the closest place to look would be in Acts and listen to uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching Yeshua. So we're going to pick up kind of right in the middle of his message, but you'll understand. Verse 25, for David speaks concerning him, Yeshua. David is talking about Yeshua. I foresaw Yahweh always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I shall not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because you will not leave my soul in Sheol. King James says hell. But you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You shall make me full of joy with your countenance. Now, now Peter is quoting and or referring to Psalm 16. Focus on what he said there in Acts 2.27. He said, you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. The soul not being left in Sheol, Sheol is the abode of the dead. Now, it's, it's really a shame that we're going to have to pause Enoch right now because in Enoch 21 and following, Enoch goes into a lot of detail about Sheol. He goes into a lot of, of detail about this abode and the different chambers that are there and how different people go to different places and how they're divided. But we're, we're going to pause it for a minute. 
And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail this morning. We'll get to it when we get to Acts 21. Just simply know this, that, that he says here that you're not going to leave my soul in Sheol. The dead, not the body, the dead go to Sheol. It's a holding place for the dead. Again, we'll go over that in greater detail later. Know this, the body does not go to Sheol. The body goes into a grave. The soul, the spirit goes into a abode known in Hebrew, Hebrew as Sheol. All right. Peter said this in Acts 2.27. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. So when he said you're not going to leave my soul in Sheol. That's a different thing than leaving my body for corruption. Right. You're not going to allow your Holy One to see corruption. This is talking about the body decaying in the earth. How do I know that? Because that's exactly what Peter explains it to be. Read his next statement, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So that's exactly what he's talking about. He didn't say David ceased to exist. He said, David's body is in that sepulcher. I can take you and show him to you. Right? right? His soul is in Sheol. His body is in the grave. <clears throat> there are always these two things. Dead and buried. Dead and buried. The state of being dead does not mean to cease to exist. It means that you got separated from your body. You exit your body. And when you exit your body, your body gets buried. Exiting our body, the term we use to describe that is death. He died. If I say he died, I don't mean he ceased to exist. I mean he exited his body. Death is not the termination of our existence. It's just a departing of our soul out of the body. Paul said it like this when, when he came near to the end of his race. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm about to depart this old body, is what he said. When we depart our bodies, our soul, spirit, whatever you want to call that, that thing that makes us us, goes to Sheol and our bodies get buried. And our souls rest, our bodies decay. And that's Peter's point. He said in his sermon that day, David in Psalm 16 wasn't talking about himself. He was prophesying about Yeshua. Yeshua did not leave, Yahweh did not leave Yeshua's soul in Sheol. He was raised out of there. We talk more later about what part of Sheol he was in. But Yahweh did not leave Yeshua in Sheol. He resurrected him out of there and he did not let his body see corruption. He resurrected that too, glorified that and put Yeshua back in a body. Okay. He is the first fruits of them that sleep. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in the Messiah shall all be made alive. Notice it doesn't say in the Messiah all were made alive. Or in Messiah all have been made alive. It says in Messiah all shall be made alive. That's future tense. Death separates us from the body. Made alive is when we are placed back into a resurrected body. Another example of this that's going to help us is John chapter 11. Yeshua is always extremely accurate with the words he uses. Precise might be a better word. He's very precise and accurate with the words he uses. John eleven eleven. these things said Yeshua, and after that he said unto them, to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, 
but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then his disciples said to him, Master, if he sleeps, he's doing well. They said that because Lazarus had been sick. Howbeit Yeshua spoke of his death. So notice how he talked about death. He's asleep. He didn't say Lazarus is up there walking through the meadow with Abraham and I got to go get him, tell him, come back. Abraham's up there with his grandpa and they're talking about the good old days. He meant what he said. Lazarus is asleep and I got to go wake him. <clears throat> Yeshua spoke about his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Yeshua unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. What does that mean? Did he cease to exist? No. He, he's gone to Sheol to sleep. His body's in a tomb. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there for the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. He knew how everybody in Jerusalem hated Yeshua. There's a chance of dying if you go near there. Then when Yeshua came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. His body's been in that grave for four days days. He is in Sheol. He has no body. He, his soul and his body are separate. And according to Yeshua, he's sleeping. Well, what Yeshua is going to do is reunite him with his body. But this thing that takes place in John chapter 11 is a miracle, not a resurrection. <coughs> What's the difference between a miracle and a resurrection? In a resurrection, will you get this same old body back? No. no. Lazarus is going to get the same old body back. That's not a resurrection. It's a miracle. <clears throat> Yeshua said, Lazarus, come forth. He's calling Lazarus out of sleep in Sheol to enter back into his body. Because when he comes back in that body, he's alive again. Okay? So we need to allow these scriptures to awaken our eyes to the truth stated in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. That every man in his order, the Messiah, the firstfruits, afterward they that are the Messiahs at his coming. We will be resurrected at his coming. When he comes, the dead in him will rise first. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Yahweh, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I'm going to pause right there because it just... <laughs> I did a funeral several years ago. Uh... And while I was doing the funeral, there was a couple sitting about a third of the way back, right on the aisle. And I could tell I was making them angry preaching this funeral. <clears throat> because I was calling death an enemy. And that was irritating them. Uh, because... I'd heard people say, and I don't like, well, God needed another angel. God needed this. And, and I was, uh, so I was saying things like, you know, when, when Yahweh needs you, he doesn't use death. De death is his enemy. It says so right here. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is not Yahweh's friend. Anyway, when I finished, we're all filing out the front door and that couple is right in front of me as we're walking out. And the wife is elbowing the husband, literally elbowing him. Tell him, 
tell him. I can hear. Tell him. He finally stopped and he turned around and said, Brother, I just got to let you know that I disagree with what you said about death being the enemy. I said, well, sir, you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with the Bible. I, I don't understand how people can read stuff like this and think that, that Yahweh uses death. Death is enemy. Verse 27. I don't know why I thought you need to know that. Maybe you didn't. Maybe I just needed to rehearse it for myself. I later found out he was a Baptist preacher. Verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is clear or manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. That's a different subject, but Yahweh's supreme Elohim, Yeshua is his son, who is over, who is over all things except Yahweh. Yahweh is over him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that puts all things under him, that Yahweh may be all in all. By heavenly structure, their structure, Yahweh gave Yeshua authority over everything and everyone. At his name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess that he is master over all. He is the king of all kings, but there will come a day when he has subdued all things and every one, and he will turn and surrender them and himself back to the Father, that Yahweh may be all in all. Verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in the Messiah, Yeshua, our Master. I die daily. If after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage, it, advantage does it give me? If the dead rise not, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications are corrupt. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I like the Good News Bible there. It says, don't be fooled. Bad, companion, bad companions will ruin good character. Verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of Yahweh. I speak this to your shame. In other words, here's the point Paul's driving home. If you believe in a resurrection of the dead, it should have an impact on the way you live your daily life. He said, wake up. Stop transgressing Torah. So what it sin not means stop transgressing Torah. Start walking in obedience to Torah. That's what it means when it says awake to righteousness. He's saying this life is not the end. All right. <clears throat> Let's take a deep breath because we need to read some more. I don't want to. I don't want to stop. Let's let's continue reading. If, if rising is important enough for Yahweh to put Remiel over it, we need to read about it. Verse thirty-five. But some will say, how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? You fool, that which you sow is not quickened except it die. And that which you sow, you sow not that body that shall be but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but Yahweh gives it a body as it has pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. Angels have celestial bodies, you and I have terrestrial bodies made out of the clay. Verse 41, and there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resur resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. <clears throat> Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the master from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, 
we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. In other words, there's a resurrection coming. And just like when you plant a kernel of corn in the ground, you don't see a great big huge kernel of corn come up out of the ground. You see something entirely different that was trapped inside that body come up out of the ground. And he's saying that's the same thing that's going to happen to us. We're, we're going to be uh, sown an earthy body. But when he resurrects us, that body that we come out up with is going to be totally different from this one. In glory, in honor, in power, in ability, it's going to be quite a body. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh, neither does corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Incorruptible means there's nothing that can... Nothing ever again that can happen to our bodies that will make us weak, that will make us sick, that would make us depressed, that would make us sad. Nothing can make a blemish come on us anymore. Incorruptible. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That is, we live forever. So when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to Yahweh, which gives us the victory through our master, Yeshua, the Messiah. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of Yeshua, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in your master. Here's the point. There's going to be a resurrection. And whether we are sleeping or alive, we're all going to receive new bodies. That's what we got to stay focused on. We can't lose our focus on that and begin to think, well, what we do here doesn't matter. We need to awaken to righteousness and sin not. Remiel is over those who rise. I, I don't know what he's doing for those who are sleeping in Sheol. I, I don't even know if perhaps his job includes making sure that everybody's body can be accounted for. You know, some bodies decay, some destroyed by fire, some are uh, lost at sea. Does his duty include making sure that the bodies of those that rise are accounted for? I don't know. Does he make sure that nothing disturbs us while we sleep? I don't know. Does he sound the alarm to awaken us? I don't know. I only know two things. He's over those who rise. And those who have faith in Yeshua and keep the commandments are going to be raised. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yeshua will Yahweh bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of Yeshua, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of Yeshua shall not prevent them which are asleep. For Yeshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of Yahweh, and the dead in Yeshua will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet Yeshua in the air, and so shall we ever be with Yeshua. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There's going to be a resurrection. And until that time comes, Remiel is over those who rise. Now, i got to point out, and I do this as we close, that Remiel is not said to be over the righteous who will rise. He said to be over those who will rise. The unrighteous are going to rise also, you know. Yes. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. <clears throat> and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Two resurrections. 
Luke 14, 13, Yeshua said, When you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you shall be blessed, for they cannot recompense you. For you shall be re recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So Yeshua is separating the resurrection of the just from the resurrection of the unjust. Revelation 20 speaks about this. Revelation 20 verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the, re this is the first resurrection. So not everybody partakes in the first resurrection. In Revelation 20 verse 11, it says this, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before Elohim. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, I think we've always probably been taught and always imagined that the things that were written in those books were their works. What if that's not it? They stood before Elohim and the books were opened. Let me read the next couple of verses and I'll come back to that. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Remiel, <clears throat> is he over those who also wait in the different chamber of Sheol? There's a chamber for the righteous and a chamber for the unrighteous. It says the unrighteous will be raised in a second resurrection and they'll stand before Yahweh and be judged according to what was written in the books. The dead were judged out of what was written in the books. How, how we not really let that sink in? The unrighteous. The righteous are resurrected. The unrighteous are judged out of what's written in the books. Could that be Torah? Mm -hmm. Listen to Yeshua. John chapter 5 verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, mm -hmm. in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So could it be that Revelation 20 is saying that copies of Torah are opened and men are going to be judged according to what's written in the books and according to their works? Here's what's written. Here's what you did. You violated Torah. Could it be a reference to copies of the gospel being opened? Where Yeshua sternly warned his followers not to even think he came to destroy the law and the prophets. Could it be a reference to copies of the gospels where Yeshua sternly warned that those who practice lawlessness can cry out, Lord, all they want but it will not deliver them on the day of judgment. They're going to be told to depart. It just simply says, those who are judged out of the books, whatever those books are, and those whose names are not written in the book of life are going to be cast into a lake of fire. It stands the reason to me that the books that are being opened are the eternal books of Yahweh's sacred scripture. Yes. Blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. I'm thankful that Yahweh in his mercy has delivered me from the second death and will raise me in the first resurrection when Yeshua comes. I'm thankful that Yeshua has gone before me and because he's gone before me, he's going to come for me. 
I'm thankful for Remiel and, and all that he's doing for those who will rise. I don't know what that is, but I'm thankful he's doing it. Aren't you glad we're not miserable? Yes. Aren't you glad we've got a hope? We live in hope. There's going to be a resurrection and, and when it takes place, he's coming back for us. Revelation says it twice. Those who have the faith of Yeshua and keep his commandments. Those are the ones he's coming back for. Hallelujah. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. His name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you.